We stand our ground. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Battle for the Boy. Um, hello, and welcome back to 2017, Death or Dishonor. Today we're going to be covering the updates for the two focus trees for Romania and Yugoslavia, which were originally released with the Death or Dishonor DLC. These updates will be available for those who have the DLC Death or Dishonor, so this has nothing to do with Battle for the Bosporus. If you already own Death or Dishonor, you get this for free. So, let's get straight into it with Yugoslavia. As seen here, Yugoslavia is uh, pretty thick compared to how it used to look. There's got to be, what, over 20 more focuses here? And we jump straight in with the Yugoslavian Communist Path, which has got an additional five focuses at the bottom of it, seen with the Pan-Balkan Initiative, which gives you the options to invite Romania, Greece and Hungary and Turkey to your Slavic Workers' Congress. It basically just expands upon the previous faction from Death or Dishonor with some new members. What's more interesting is the actual changes to how that Congress and later Council will actually operate. Instead of just inviting the countries to the faction, you now have a decision system in which you have to instigate peasant uprisings in those countries. Once you've done that, it's your job to try and convert them to being communist before you can instigate a communist coup, win their civil war for them, so you can push them into your faction. It's basically got a lot more involved process to it, instead of just quickly getting the focus to invite them to a faction. Once you've instigated those civil wars, you'll end up with a map that looks something like this. Very, very purply blue. What gets me is they're all not quite the same colour of bluey purple. It's like, it's not quite right and just looking at it makes me hurt. But that's okay, they are differentiating which country's which, I completely understand. But since the communist path was already very strong, and now even stronger, let's take a look at the less seen monarchist path. In this image kindly provided, we can see the previous monarchist path and the current one, which in effect basically looks like it's more than doubled the amount of focuses and things you can do in the tree. The design inspiration seems to have taken mutually exclusive focuses to heart, because when you look at this, I can see like 13 mutually exclusive focuses, there's going to be a lot of choices you have to make, and Yugoslavia was already about making difficult choices, so it's just 10 times harder now. The first key choice is deciding whether you're going to align more with the Axis or more with the Allies, which you have to do at the very start. This includes deciding whether you want Axis capital or Allied capital, as opposed to just attracting foreign capital from before. Following down the Axis path, we have Evolution, which leads to ways to deal with the ever-rising problem of Croatia. As a quick reminder, Yugoslavia starts off with kind of three to four pretty bad spirits. The first one being Croatian opposition, which gives you negative 30 stability, Macedonian opposition, which makes everything cost a lot more, and Slovene nationalism, which means your production efficiency growth is reduced. This one being the least problematic, but the other two, pretty bad all things considered. So to deal with Croatia, originally establishing the Banovia of Croatia would release them as a puppet. Nobody liked this. So, now, establishing the Banovia of Croatia means you have a reduced national spirit, which isn't so damning for your country. Crush the Utasa, everwise, has a way for you to completely alleviate that entire stability debuff. Crush the Utasa now starts two missions, the Uprising and to circumvent the Uprising. In this, you're either going to need to create concessions for the Croatians, so they don't uprise and you can hopefully put that uprising to bed, or try and crack down on it. One way or another, whether you appease them or fight them off in a civil war, you're going to need to deal with the Croatians if you want to get rid of that national spirit. Continuing down the Axis path, the other way to deal with the two national spirits causing us problems with Slovenia and Macedonia is to just give them away. Just give them. Simple. Slovenia can be given away to Italy, or perhaps Germany as seen from this picture, and Macedonia can be given away to Bulgaria. It feels like you're kind of giving away your problems to appease the bigger powers, so they don't eat you. There is of course also the option to keep them, seen with concessions for Macedonia at the bottom there, although I'm not sure how the Bulgarians would feel about that. So in order to give away these new states, Paradox has actually recreated the states of Yugoslavia, adding in three new states in total. 
As we can see here, Bosnia has now been divided into Bosnia and Herzegovina as two separate states, Kosovo has been added into the region of Moreva, also with southern Serbia seen at the bottom there. This is probably to give some more historical looking borders if Bulgaria is to eat up southern Serbia and Macedonia. Going back up to the allied path with limited self-government, those states also come in handy with this path, which seems to give you the ability to balkanize yourself in 1936. The first two focuses again are to deal with Croatia, and in this one you have the option to again release Croatia as a puppet as done previously, integrate them, or it says here completely devolved them into two separate entities, Croatia and Dalmatia. We are truly in the age of old history here. This goes even further with Banat in the northeast, whether you decide what to give it to Hungary, fortify it against Hungary, or make it its own autonomous area for Slavic Transylvania. If you choose to go down the true path of autonomy for every single state, you're going to end up with a Yugoslavia that looks like this. In total, Yugoslavia can now be balkanized into 11 different countries, the notable mentions being the added country of Kosovo over there, and also those two countries at the top, one of which is Vojvodina and Transylvania. What's interesting about the Transylvania Slavic focus is we previously saw on another dev diary that Transylvania owned all of Romania, so I'm wondering if doing that focus gives that particular country cause on all of that Transylvanian-Romanian region? Time will tell, I suppose. So reaching the bottom of the Allied path, you have the two options seen here. Towards independence is making sure that all those released countries join in a one big faction. This is good because it gives you the option to create a good defence league and an army, which can double the manpower and army count of the starting Yugoslavia. On the other hand, we have a United Kingdom, which is where you've completely balkanized your country and now you're bringing all the boys back together again. I do wonder if reuniting the kingdoms makes you an even stronger version of Yugoslavia than what you started with, or whether you go through all of that rigmarole and get nothing at the end of it. So I'm hoping that these three focuses here are really powerful, because you did just destroy your own country. The last part of the tree, which is shared between both the Axis and the Allied side, is deciding what to do with the pre-existing monarchy. The two parts are going down the coronation or the royal wedding, depending on whether you've dismantled the previous regency or continued with Prince Paul. With the update, Prince Paul is no longer seen as a non-aligned abstract character, but more of a collaborator with the Axis, which gives him the buffs you see here in the form of political power gain, but also fascist diplomacy acceptance. On the other hand, if you choose to end the Regency with the Allies, you can completely skip the fact that Peter II is a small child and stick him straight into power, as seen here. In this, you'll have to play as a 12-year-old child running the country of Yugoslavia to the best of his ability. Luckily, given time, King Peter can come of age and he gets all the buffs that come with it, before deciding whether he wants to get married, seen with the royal wedding focus. The Royal Wedding works as a really cool event in the game because it's actually quite dynamic in how it works. Depending on the world situation, you can choose who you want to marry. If Germany goes with the Kaiser, you could marry one of the Kaiser's daughters. If Spain goes with the Carlists during the Civil War, you can marry one of the uh, children of the Carlist dynasty. This goes on with um, Princess Alexandra of Greece and Princess Maria Francesca of Italy. This is all the examples that the dev diary mentions, although it would be cool to know if there's other options, assuming that maybe Austria-Hungary is formed, or whether France goes monarchist. These are all potential thoughts. The reason choosing your marriage is so important is because whoever you choose to marry gives you a fast-track path to join the faction of whoever's country your wife's monarchy originates from. So if that's Germany, you can join the central powers. With that said, let's move on to the other country that's getting an update. Romania. Romania's ability to change sides during the war has been changed into the form of two decisions, joining the Allies and the Axis, depending on whether you've changed your ideology with your focus tree. It's pretty straightforward now, just a simple click of a button. In the Balkans' dominance part of the Romanian focus tree, under Puppet Bulgaria you could divide Yugoslavia, which gave you an event to try and annex Yugoslavia or turn them into lots of smaller puppet countries. The new system for Divide Yugoslavia mirrors the Spanish Civil War in some ways, where you're having to claim strength over various states that you want to annex, 
until you eventually have enough strength to issue an ultimatum to the Yugoslavians. Depending on how many things you've claimed and how strong those claims are will determine the outcome of whether they accept or not. I think the interaction here is quite cool in that it's not just a simple event. I just wonder how it's going to interact with maybe exploiting the system by making weak claims of strength just so you can get an annex war goal and eat them all. I guess we'll find out when it comes out, but I'm interested to see how this one works. For a database change, Romania will now start the game as democratic, to more accurately reflect how it was in actual 1936 Romania. While I'm all for historical accuracy, I do wonder how this is going to work with the Institute Royal Dictatorship path for the monarchy branch, because it's one of the opening focuses, and I'd find it strange if Carol II can immediately become the dictator of a democratic country. I wonder if it changes you to become non-aligned, or whether he just becomes a dictator of a democratic country? I'm not really sure. In other news, Romania has a new fascist leader in the form of Octavian, who kind of looks shifty, staring at me from a distance over here. This is because if you want to get the previous fascist leader of Ion Antonoscu, you'll have to do the focus appoint the pro-axis government and get him from the Iron Guard. I guess he's seen as a more valuable leader that you want to get later on. The final change to the focus tree is that King Michael's coup has been moved to the bottom of the Axis path. This is quite interesting because it's supposed to represent that King Michael is now cooing against the Axis government, or the pro-Axis government, instead of cooing against his own father. This of course changes how the game was originally sort of meta-played, because it would be positive to just immediately do King Michael's coup to stop all of the events to do with um, King Carol's spending. Now you have to go down all of these focuses to get it. I don't know if people will do that as much anymore. You basically have to, if you want to go monarchist with King Michael, you have to go fascist. It's a complicated system, that's for sure. Oh yeah, and there's a guy called Constantine and he has a new hat. Okay, that's everything. Um, yeah, I'm really cool with this. I think this is a great idea. Going back to old focus trees and sort of updating them with the newer mechanics, with the new interactions with modern focus trees. I hope they go and do this with um, the Commonwealth focus trees because Australia, India and New Zealand, they could really use an update. Like if, <laughs> if any countries get a rework, the ones from the original DLC would be the best. But yeah, I think this is all really cool. We even get to see some more releasable nations. I wonder if this means we're going to get new um, other releasable nations, or even some more formable nations. I did make a video saying that some releasable nations might be added, although I didn't expect these. My thoughts were things like um, Texas, Macau, Hong Kong, maybe a way to release Slovakia early on. But maybe we'll see that in the next Dev Diary. So I guess I'll see you then. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this quick summary. If you enjoyed, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. Okay, thanks. Bye.